Uh, so hi everyone, uh, welcome all to the CIC lecture. So today we have with us here uh, Dr. Evan Lake. So Dr. Lake completed her PhD in the Department of Medical Biophysics at the University of Toronto. And her work focused on multi-level imaging methods in a rodent model of local ischemic stroke. Now her work focuses on applying connection-based predictive modeling to understand diagnostic phenotypes in autism and attention, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, as well as developing simultaneous multimodal bolt fMRI and white blood calcium imaging technology. So welcome and go. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. This is the first talk I'm giving in person since before the pandemic and that's been, uh, it's been a long time coming. So it's really good to be here. Um, up front, please, please, please interrupt me from just word vomiting up here by myself, um, ask questions, clarification, any of the above. So that would be really great. And that goes for Zoom as well. Um, okay, so title of the talk is Leveraging Multimodal Imaging to Better Understand Brain Network Dynamics. It's sort of a, a broad catch-all for the preclinical imaging approaches that uh, we do in the lab. So I'm not going to focus on any of the human neuroimaging stuff that we've done, just on the preclinical side. Um, so this is, broadly speaking, developing tools to take sort of a multi-pronged approach. And what I mean by that, I'm going to use sort of a, a story that I'm adopting shamelessly from a PhD student um, that I've worked really closely with who defended recently. Um, and the way he described his multimodal approach was to sort of start with this story about the tale of the blind men and the elephant, which it's been around a while. So probably people have heard of it. But um, to take you through, first of all, I really prefer this title. Um, it's much more akin to what actually happens in a lab. So let's say you've got um, one camp of scientists and they're examining this, this thing that they don't know um, what it looks like. Um, it's an elephant, we can see that, they can't. So if they're examining the trunk, say they see, okay, it's very snake-like, that's, that's what an elephant is actually like. And that's based on what tools they have, their field of view, the resolution, what kind of signal they're getting. However, you may have another equally good set of scientists who are using a different set of tools and have access to a different field of view for one reason or another. And they say, no, 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 no. I, I, an elephant really looks like a tree. Trust us. It looks like a tree. However, if you could maybe put them in the same room um, and eventually they'd be able to say, okay, it's, it's an elephant and we know what it looks like, but it takes a long time to get there. Um, there's a lot of morals to that story. Um, however, there are different ways that you can take it. Um, and one of the ways that we're taking is that it's, it's, it's a better world when you can try and put two things together. However, we're definitely not looking at an elephant, we're looking at the brain. Um, so what are we looking at when we're trying to look at the brain? We're using spatial and temporal scales with different modalities. And what does the brain consist of? You've got neurons and they show some level of organization. Um, at even a fine grain scale, you have boutons or synapses, and that gives you some, some set of sense of what a brain does or, or, or a set of functional measures that you can get. However, those, those neurons don't exist in isolation. They're in sort of a soup of other different cell types, other, other different kinds of neurons. There's vasculature. There's a whole bunch of things that happen in this milieu of that particular neuron. Also, that small field of view, which looks like a bit of a two-photon imaging field of view, is within a brain. And the brain has subcortical regions, cortical regions. It's got um, a brain stem. It's got a cerebellum. It's got olfactory bulbs if you're looking at a rodent. Um, housed inside an animal that has its own set of systems and different organ systems that interplay with one another. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with the gut microbiome and the influence it's having um, on a number of different brain functions. And those manifest in very complicated behaviors, even at a rodent level. You have different social interactions, you have sex-based differences, and the list goes on and on and on. However, we're also hoping to take this cross species. We would like to see how this works in different people and how those people work in a population and have different senses of behavior. So with this multimodal imaging, we're trying to tease apart different views on this very complex, very widespread spatio-temporal different scales. And when I mean that, it's not just, do you have one Hertz imaging or 10 Hertz imaging? You have behavior, you have lifespan, you also have population. There's a huge context that we want to sort of place this in and hope that through multimodal approaches, we can maybe bridge some of these gaps across scales, across time, across species, um, to use imaging methods in an informative way for, I mean, if we're selfish, hopefully ourselves. So how do we do this? 
got this ultimate outcome, this human measurement that you, or this human phenotype that you want to be able to characterize in some way um, or inform yourself about, and you have some imaging methods that you can use actually in people. One of the selling features of MRI is you can apply it in humans longitudinally without any sort of invasive component. You also have other tools like electrophysiology. And there's some, some people out there who are uh, combining those two and you get some sets of uh, perspectives based on that. You also have animal models such as marmosets or even mice um, or other rodents. And from those, you have other modalities that are at your disposal, such as two photon imaging that I mentioned before, also one photon imaging. So that's something that I'm gonna talk about in more detail. And each of these kind of overlap with one another. So you can eventually start to get the picture of the elephant in the room here um, for better or for worse. Yeah, but every modality and every pair of modalities has trade-offs. Generally, you have this diverging coverage with spatial temporal resolution aspect that can give you headaches when you're trying to analyze your data. And that's something that I might touch on as well. Um, sometimes things play to your advantage. If you have two different perspectives on the same thing that have different sources of noise, that can help you sort out where you know what is noise and what is signal. Um, so to summarize a little bit, some dual modes implementations are, are more prevalent than others. There's some here that have never happened before. Theoretically, at least as far as I'm aware of, two photon and MRI have been posited that they can be put together and there's some systems that might get there someday, but I don't think there's actually any data sets out there yet. Please correct me if I'm wrong, because I need to talk to that person. Mm -hmm. um, there's also different modes offer different insights. Um, to, it has a brain function. You have the bold signal, you have optical fluorescence signals, you have electrophysiology signals. They're all measuring some sort of brain function, which is this nebulous thing that we're all trying to work towards. And then there's several layers of complexity that have to be overcome to actually just do these experiments. And that's what I'm gonna give a bit of an introduction to next. So no matter the set of modes, you're going to be limited in what kind of species you can use. That's quite clear. You can, and it's usually a, a function of invasiveness, be it to introduce a fluorophore or actually collect the data, whatever it might be. This is just to sort of stimulate your thinking about what you might be in for when you're looking at one modality or another, but also when you're trying to combine different modalities. You've got spatial temporal scale. It can be very limited or it can be very broad, but there's definitely a range. Coverage is something else that you need to think about. Is your data one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional? How large or small is your field of view and how versatile is that measurement? That's one great thing about fMRI. It's a highly versatile modality. You can search out many different sources of contrasts and you can also manipulate your spatial temporal resolution as it suits your application. Um, sources of contrast, sometimes they can be few. Electrophysiology is one main source of signal. I don't mean to put anything in a box. There's also um, exceptions to every rule you can come up with, um, or it can be many, such as MRI has many sources of contrast. So does uh, fluorescence imaging. Also sources of noise. This is something that I try to, to motivate in uh, different dual imaging modalities is that your sources of noise can be very different, which can really inform your signal. And is one of the reasons to go for a multimodal approach in some applications. There's also different methodological requirements for every modality. Your milieu is going to be different, or you've got different levels of evasiveness. You've got cost to consider. Um, how versatile is one versus another? Can one modality accommodate another modality really easily or not? It's pretty easy to get an electrophysiology probe in an optical imaging setup. It's hard to get an optical imaging setup into an MRI scanner. So you have to consider all these practically speaking when you're trying to do a dual or multimodal imaging approach. And I'm going to start narrowing the scale uh, scope of what I'm talking about a little bit now and go to the modalities specifically that I work with most frequently. So this is simultaneous uh, one photon imaging, which I'll go into a little bit more detail since it's a little less um, familiar to folks, um, as well as magnetic resonance imaging. So you've got the different levels of experiment when you're doing um, any kind of acquisition. You start with actually acquiring the data. And these are things that you have to consider when you're doing simultaneous MRI or even one or the other modality. You've got your surgery, perhaps, which you definitely need for an optical imaging setup. You need optical access to the access to the tissue that you're trying to look at. You've got equipment considerations. You need different expertise in different modalities that you have to find the right combination of folks to bring together. Materials, noise, confounds, as I've said before, milieu as well. Um, and then recording. 
what space or temporal resolution are you going to use? How are you going to synchronize your data? Is that important? What kind of tolerance do you have? The paper that everyone is talking about recently on Twitter, I mean, their tolerance for timing, those measurements that they were made are milliseconds. Very hard to do with an fMRI scanner. I'd really like to know exactly how they triggered their system and what kind of, um, what did they use to have one thing talk to another? Um, so one thing that we've had uh, just, this is a digression. Um, one thing that we've had challenges with is how long our TR is on our particular scanner. And we program one second or 1.8 seconds. It varies. In ver and it, it varies to the point that we're not always sure if that specific image or that slice matches up with our 10 hertz um, calcium imaging because we get slight variation in that one second over different repeats of the TR. And these are the kind of things that come out of the woodwork when you're doing this stuff. How do you figure out that it varies? We started triggering every 10 acquisitions of our fluorescent data off every single TR. So we're getting a, tr a trigger every time and then a measured from our camera 10, 10 slices after that. And sometimes it's perfectly aligned with the next trigger. Sometimes we have a 20 millisecond gap. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> and then all this feeds forward into your analysis. So you have to consider registration. Are you, and also where are you gonna try and get all your data? Are you going to do your analyses in individual space? Are you going to move to common space? If so, what common space? What are the dimensions of that common space? Um, and how do you reconcile these different spatial temporal scales? And also the pre-processing decisions. You have a whole bunch of choices that you need to make. Motion correction, nuisance regression, harmonizing across modes. Arguably for better or worse, every modality out there, you can sort of find this gold standard approach to analyzing your data. Do you adopt the gold standard for each one in isolation? Just call it a day and say that that's what they do and this is what we get out of it. Or do you try and harmonize and say, well, these folks do say this sort of bandwidth and they call it their favorite and these ones do another. Do we take the overlap? Do we take one than the other? There's no clear answer to these questions. Also exclusion criteria, they're different for different modalities. For example, for in our um, MRI versus one photon, we can do motion correction on the three-dimensional data or the two-dimensional data and get different outputs because we don't have access in the optical imaging data to that change in motion and depth. When we have a change in motion and depth from the MRI side, but we don't see it in the calcium side, what do we do with that data? Do we exclude it? Unclear. The answer is you do everything, but. Uh, to what degree do you think uh, some of these challenges are like, because you're really at the cutting edge of this and like we don't have like this kind of like standard approach yet, I guess what would be the benefits, but also like the dangers of like starting to adopt a standard approach if more and more centers wanted to do that? I, I would say that it's not unique for us. We just have the, we have the opportunity to revisit these questions. They're, they're all, and I think that's a good opportunity because we can go back to either community and say like, how have you dealt with it? And they're like, well, everybody else did it this way, well, but well, why? And right. so it's, it's by, do, by being at the, by being in the lonely space <laughs> of doing these two at the same time, we get to revisit a lot of these questions for better or for worse. But I think they exist everywhere and for everyone. Just we have less dogma <laughs> that we're maybe burdened with than some. Um, it means that we both make friends and enemies at the same time, it seems. So, but happy to talk about specifics um, if you have questions on that too. Um, so as I promised, a little bit on the mesoscale imaging technology that we use, um, since it's a little less familiar, I think, to this audience than fMRI, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so for this, uh, generally, or at least at the outset, we started with genetically encoded calcium indicators. So this is just GFP introduced um, to give us a fluorescence signal of neuronal activity. And this is grossly what the data look like on a good day. So this is an encoded indicator, Snapchat 5, GPS 6 slow. Um, this is recorded at 10 hertz and played back in real time. So this animal is unanesthetized. You see sort of blooms of neural activity happening as hot colors and sort of decreases in signal in, in cool colors here. And you get nice bilateral activations. There's, uh, but I mean, to the keen eye, you can also see that some artifacts in the data, you get shadowing from the blood vessels and it's, it's sort of its own beast, but it's, it's a nice, uh, signal to work with, that's for sure. And traditionally it's collected using a setup based on this cartoon. So you have LED light source, you have some uh, forming um, optics that go on top of this. So you've got a dichroic mirror being sort of the most driver of that component. Um, you have an objective that sits above your animal. And then you also have a camera 
CMOS camera typically that records these data on the other end. So it's a very top-down setup. It's got tons of metal components and it occupies about a square meter of space. And the first thing that we tried to do in the lab is get this inside our 11.7 magnet, which has a bore diameter of about nine centimeters. It's about the size of the palm of your hand. One. Yeah. So this is a this is the trade-off for this modality um, is field of view for resolution. So we do not have single neural on resolution by any stretch of the imagination. A single pixel in this video is about 25 by 25 microns. Yep, all factory bulb to cerebellum. Okay, so to accomplish this challenge, we came up with this scheme. So in the room neighboring the magnet, we have our MR on friendly stuff that we can't be without. So we have our fiber optic bundle that goes into the scanner. We have our liquid light guide that goes into the scanner. And then we have our camera and light source sitting outside of the magnet room. And then inside the magnet room, we have um, our, uh, the other end with our, all our optics on the end of this long fiber, um, which dovetails with our in-house built RF coil. And that slides into this uh, magnet bore. So this is what the business end looks like. Um, you've got the uh, sort of telecentric lens optical components that the light's redirected through this prism onto the mouse that's held beneath and the RF coil sits above. Light guide comes in from the bottom and just opening it up as a cartoon here, you can see the light path. So we've got the light coming in from the bottom being redirected off the dichroic mirror to the prism onto the head of the mouse and then the signal coming back up passing through the dichroic and out the other end through our fiber bundle. One of the key components of this setup is the fiber bundle. So it's about 2 million fibers that are arranged in an array and, and held together like that. And it's about 15 feet long, so it can carry our signal to the next room. So this is what the, the setup on the top of the mouse looks like. Um, so we do skull thinning for almost all of our preparations. So the skull is left intact, replaced with dental cement and glue, glass on top, and this dovetails with the four points of immobilization that slide into this little holder that sits right beneath our coil. Happy to go into the details of that setup if anybody's curious on that. Um, we use a nice saddle coil that was built um, for us so that we get this nice SNR from cortex to subcortical regions. And I do have to emphasize that uh, I had a partner in crime in building this setup, a uh, wonderful PhD student, uh, Shin Shin, who's since moved on to do sort of more work in visual development. This is the only picture I could find of her. <laughs> um, she's an avid hiker, so she's out on the trail, so it's true to, true to what she likes to do. Um, but she, it, she was excellent to work with on this, uh, on this setup. So back to what the data looks like. Um, so we've These are some of our favorites. Um, this is sort of two videos played through of the bold imaging signal just sped up over time. Um, that's our resolu isotropic resolution of the whole brain. A little bit of coverage missing on the cerebellum and olfactory bulb, something we're working on. I'm sorry if those are your favorite parts of anatomy for one reason or another. Um, just going through the slices here. So that's where we're starting. Um, and one of the hardest points is to try and get this into common space. So if we take a static image of the optical imaging setup, this is what it looks like. Um, some of the artifacts that you can see in this images, we've got some dead pixels in our fiber because that's reality. You can also, if you really look closely, sort of see a hash mark kind of on top of the data and that's where our fiber optics fit together. So I, the, the description that I use is kind of look like looking through a dirty screen. So it looks a little bit like that. And this has all kinds of implications for motion correction because motion correction loves a hard edge, but your brain is for better or worse moving behind this static picture. So I'm happy to talk to anybody in the audience about those challenges of motion correction and registration because it's something we spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, so to move this into common space, we first start with a 3D angiogram time of flight because these vessels on the top of the cortex in the MRI space look very much like the vessels we can see in our uh, optical imaging data. So we don't need to use any contrast agent to get these data. And then we have a beautiful picture, mostly of the middle cerebral arteries in both sets of images that we can then co-register and move our multimodal data into the same space. At least from a structural MRI perspective, we still have a number of steps that we need to do in order to get actually our fMRI data into that same common space. 
So I will emphasize that we've had a lot of help with pre-processing of our data through the very famous Gabe, um, who's been here. He's been an excellent help to our group in terms of pre-processing our fMRI data, and we're very thankful. Um, as well as for these multimodal registrations that I've just sort of given a gross overview on, um, Zinios, um, who's faculty in the same department that I am, um, developed BioMer Suite software um, that really helped us be able to sort of do this in a minimally painful way. All right. I've been talking way too much. Does anybody know um, Choose Your Own Adventure books? I'm sorry, some. This is a Choose Your Own Adventure talk now. Um, so I, I, somebody, somebody did this in a talk once and I don't remember who it was, but I loved it. Um, so we've got a number of things we can talk about now. Uh, these are a smattering of a few of the projects that we have in the lab. Some of them are very early on in the pipeline. Some of them are a little bit further along. Um, but I'm going to try and encourage someone in the audience to pick one. So we've got some work that we've been doing on traumatic brain injury. Um, we've got some Alzheimer's disease work. We've done some, some awake multimodal imaging. Um, We've got some work that's just calcium imaging data, looking at differences in cortical networks um, across different cell types um, and states awake and anesthetized. And we've also got a really neat sort of side project story um, where we did this real trans species sort of investigation of neurodevelopment as well as congenital heart um, defects. So if I could please have someone who's never asked a question in the seminar before pick one. On Zoom or, or otherwise? <clears throat> AD. Okay. Where is AD? Flip ahead slide. Sorry? Flip ahead slide. Flip ahead. Yes, exactly. Yes. Here we go. Oh, if somebody knows how to do that, I need to. I, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, Alzheimer's disease. So I'm going to skip the motivation for Alzheimer's disease because I think it's quite clear. Everybody's unfortunately probably got at least first degree or second degree experience. Um, there's also a, lo a lot that's out there in the literature. Um, so this was um, a collaboration with Dr. Steve Stripmatter, who's pictured up there. Um, and he had this really, really cool um, Alzheimer's, double knock-in Alzheimer's disease model, which recapitulates um, both amyloid beta, um, as well as tau pathophysiology in the mouse. I'm not an expert in modeling Alzheimer's disease. I'm not an expert in Alzheimer's disease. So I was really, really happy to have Steve come to me with mice that have this phenotype and we could use imaging to sort of dig into some of the characteristics. And Francesca, which I need to get a better picture where you can see her face, um, was uh, really spearheaded the actual, a lot of the actual work in this project. So first challenge, we have this really, really cool double knock-in Alzheimer's disease model that we want to look at. However, part of our multimodal imaging interest relies on this optical fluorescence signal. So in theory, we could create this triple transgenic mouse, uh, wait several years, have to get at least a grant to fund the generation of this model, or we could maybe take a side route and try something else. So for this, we worked with a very talented postdoc that I knew from when I started at Yale, Ali Homodi, um, and a paper that I think needs more um, citations quickly was this way of introducing GCAMP into any mouse that you can get a hold of at an early point in development. So if you take a POP, P0, or 1, and you inject GCAMP virus, old school GCAMP virus, into the transverse sinuses on both sides of the brain, you get this absolutely beautiful expression very early on in development throughout the whole brain. So the key is that the blood-brain barrier is underdeveloped at this very early stage. So we use this very fast and uh, cold snap anesthetization protocol, do this very minimally invasive, I would argue, um, bilateral injection into the transfer sinuses. The skull is soft enough to easily be pierced. I should have given a trigger warning for surgery pictures. I'm sorry. Um, into the transfer sinuses takes less than 10 minutes per animal. And then you get this lovely expression and we have over a 90% success rate in doing this. Yep. There's some tricks and whatnot. You want to remove the whole litter at once from the, from the mum do this and then reintroduce them all together at the same time. And it takes a little finessing, but once you have someone properly trained and sort of how to do this back and forth procedure, 
we have about 90% fluorescence and less than 5% rejection rate from the mums. The rejection rate is like seven. Yeah, there's no pups in the morning. Yeah. yeah. But that's very rare once you've practiced the procedure a number of times and you have a mum that's not the first litter. Right. So, but it, it works really well. Not the first litter. Not the first litter. Yeah. Have you, have you tracked your we have currently we're on technician number two. Francesca is the one who's spearheaded this in the double knock ins. Female, uh, female, both of ours. Okay. Yeah. So, um, however, um, in our in the lab that Ali came from, he male okay. also had high success rates. However, uh, not working specifically with the double knock ins, which were much more challenging than wild types. So if, if you guys are interested in this procedure, we're more than happy to train, go back and forth. I think it's immensely useful. Is there also some AD, there's which uh, takes the brain, that takes the fetus as soon as it happens. It doesn't take me into IV. Do you apply those varieties or are you thinking about it? We, we thought about it. You need a lot more virus for those. These you can use very small amounts. Um, so that's what attracted us to this. You can also, uh, we're working on optimizing doing more than one because um, we'd like to target different flavors of neurons with different fluorophores. But yeah, no, it's, that, was, that was plan B. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so just to demonstrate a little bit what this works, it looks like once it's done. So this is a double knock-in mouse, five months of age after we did this. And these data were collected with our simultaneous multimodal imaging technology. Um, inside the scanner. And these are what the data look like um, in the terms of transparency with basically no preprocessing. So this has had no noise correction, no motion correction. This is what we get when we're at the scanner saying, is it working? Is it working? Is it working? Um, so this, we were very excited that this was an approach that was available to us both because we can apply it in the double knock-ins or any other disease model that we, we would choose off the shelf that also leverages the pros and cons of being able to manipulate the genome of the mouse. Another super cool thing is this works cross species. You can do this approach with viral injections in a rat and you also get beautiful expressions. All right, so what did the experiment look like? First, we start with these um, simultaneous injections. Then we do the head implants um, at approximately three months of age um, so that we have optical access to the cortex and also this serves as a point of immobilization. Then we go down the road of longitudinally imaging these mice. So can we collect data through the relevant time period for the disease phenotype that we wanna look at? So the time points we chose based on mostly Steve's prior work was four months, six months, nine months. And then we got really excited because we still had mice and imaged them again at 12 months of age. The circles represent about 10 minutes uh, are exactly 10 minutes of fMRI data per imaging session. Do you have a sense of like what stage of yeah, there's comp not in these animals, but complementary in the same same data set. We have histology um, as well as behavioral characterization at this time point matched. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to check out with this um, can never get surgery pictures to look good on the projector. Trust me, on my screen they look nicer. Um, if anybody wants to see, we're more than happy to share. So these are just raw images of what does the surgery prep look like across time because this is a big concern we had if there's going to be any skull growth are we going to get bubbles manifesting in the preparation are we going to get detachment over time um, and we were very happy to see that for better or for worse we had really good longevity in terms of these head implants um, so as I was saying before with the multimodal imaging, you get a lot of trade-offs, pros and cons when you're doing, and sometimes you get pros. So because we have to get this whole cortical field of view for our optical imaging method with skull thinning, that, that head plate is very well attached. Um, so the compromises we made for one in order to get our contrast to start with played out in our favor in terms of the longevity of the prep. And we also get calcium signal. So these are just single time points because I was getting scared of the number of videos I was trying to cram into this presentation. Um, over time, so showing sort of the same regions activating and these are single frame, um, just background subtracted um, neuronal signal here. So what does low dose isoflurane mean in this case? 0.5%. And uh, I recall from the setup that there were some kind of attachment points that were part of the uh, surgery. Yep. So are they like fixed? 
but so that glass, the glass cover and such is actually attached. So we've done some, we've done some optimization on the, on the head plate. We originally in the paper that the published the methodology had a plastic sort of 3D printed component to it. We abandoned that. We've gone full glass. Um, so we use a water jet to cut our specific glass shape. Um, and then we use four flat top screws um, to actually attach them to the coil um, inside the scanner. And we found that this to be by far the best. Having that glass to plastic head plate, doesn't, it's thick glass. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you have to singly house the mice once they have the head plate? I fought hard against that. I find that single housing, especially for this length of time, has a whole bunch of caveats in terms of behavior and everything else that we didn't want to deal with. Every animal in the cage has to have a head plate, okay. um, but they do fine. I mean, you have that we have had some trouble at the later time points with some eye infections that we have to sort of work out in the group. But since I found out without the head plates, they have the same incidence of eye infections. So um, there's always these bumps along the road, um, but definitely co-housing has been fine for us. Um, so low dose isoflurane, yes, but we got excited um, whether or not we could do this in awake. So we already have this head plate that we have some evidence that it seems to, to hold really well. So we went down the route of doing some awake training. So we took a subset of the animals at this point um, and broke them off and we did, uh, we tried our hand at awake imaging, both at nine months of age, as well as at 12 months of age. So in a subset of these data, we have also awake imaging data. Um, and that we can go to flip to chapter 27 if you want to see some of the, the awake outcomes. But um, <clears throat> now I'm just going to focus on some of the, early, the first three time points um, for the Alzheimer's data set of a little bit of what we've got right now. So very much in the trenches on trying to sort out these multimodal data, how we want to analyze them, um, whether or not we want to do it in individual space, common space, what common space if that would be. Um, and it depends on the measurements that you want to do. This is just my handy cartoon to say that there are many spaces to choose from, especially when you have multimodal data, and it does depend on your analysis that you want to do. So the first thing um, that we tried is just simple connectivity analysis. So this is a connectivity matrix of bold fMRI data collected uh, from these animals at four months of age. So you have wild types on the bottom and double knock-ins on the bottom. Wild types on the top, double knock-ins on the bottom. And this is just a regions by regions. Um, connectivity strength. So how correlated is the activity in say the visual cortex to uh, in the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere. And one thing that pops up immediately um, is that in the wild type data, you have this sort of nice um, bilateral diagonal that you see coming out. We see some sort of clusters of correlated activity that we would expect. So these features kind of speak to what we're used to seeing in these data. And there's a remarkably lower set of connectivity strengths to kind of globally in the double knocking group. Um, and four months of age is where we were kind of anticipating we might, if we got really lucky, see something. And I can go into why that is. So if we take a difference of these two and we use T statistic to sort of tell us where we might want to be looking, we can see that there are some interesting features um, that are poking, poking their head up. And this is where the, the Alzheimer's experts usually kind of get excited. They say, oh, I see this hippocampus, I like to see that, or striatum thalamus. You've got some, some interesting regions that sort of bubbling to the surface here. Um, I think it's too early in these analyses to be really excited about exactly what we're seeing. What has me more excited is the temporal features of what we're pulling out of these, da these data. So these are longitudinal data. There's the same animals in each category. And this is looking at four months, six months, and nine months. And you see this sort of decrease or asynchronous activity than this sort of pseudo normalization happening. So these are sort of, uh-oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> these, are, these are kind of very interesting longitudinal dynamics that are happening in these interrelational, interregional um, bold fMRI synchrony. Bold doesn't usually get a win like this <laughs> mm -hmm. where you see these kind of interesting imaging dynamics. Um, and you also don't necessarily get these changes that early. So the four month time point for these mice specifically, they don't show histological differences. They see behavioral differences in one of many behavioral tests. So this has us really excited to sort of tease into these early imaging changes that seem to be a harbinger of more to come. Sorry, can you uh, speak to your sample size and sex distribution? Yep, it's a mixed sex sample. So we're looking at sex effects. 
And we have about 10 to 15 animals in the different groups. And then like evenly, like, kind of, so like five female, five male? Or? Something like that. This is all lumped together um, right now, but we're, we're working hard to fill in these numbers as much as we can. But each of these ones is like multi genome type ones. It's the same comparison to show like it's the wild type, sick, uh, correlation. Same groups. It's same in that, in that time point. The survival of these animals across across uh, across these animals is pretty good. We have about thirty percent attrition up to okay. the twelve month. Okay. Yeah. So this is up to the nine month. We're doing a little better than that. I'd have to check for sure exactly what we've got at that point. Sorry, you're going to have to speak up a bit. These are the ones where we didn't have attrition. We let, held those out for this. I wanted to be, the, the same animals are represented in each of these three time points. This is bold fMRI data. We're working on it. I don't have that slide today. I'm really sorry. I wanted it. I pushed my postdoc to try and give it to me, but we didn't get there. Um, <laughs> But we're very excited to start. This is, this is a whole brain matrix, I, I should emphasize. So this is changes across the whole brain. Um, and we're very excited to look at, do we have the same kind of thing happening in that cortical field of view that we have access to with both modalities? So trust me, I want to see it as, well, as much as you do, if not more. <laughs> All right, cool. Oh, back to the beginning. Okay, that's what I had for the Alzheimer's chapter. Do we have time for... Yeah, we've got a bit more time for another story. It's one asked the last. What was the uh, last one? I've got it. <laughs> oh, the heart disease one. Okay, this guy. So this was a side project. So this is pushing my expertise um, to the edge. Uh, so I will refer you to the experts if that happens. But I thought it was a really, really cool story. So I wanted to to put it as an option. Um, so this is looking at the intersection of congenital heart disease and neurodevelopmental delay. Um, and SMC5 will become clear with time. Um, so this was in uh, collaboration with Ms. Fakopra, um, as well as Laura Ment and, and their mentee, uh, Matt O'Brien, who are pictured there. So first a little bit on sort of what we're, what we're dealing with. So about 50% of patients that have Severe congenital heart disease also have developmental um, delays of some description. So there's a high overlap here. Um, and it's, it's been presumed to be linked to episodes of prenatal hypoxia. So sometimes related to the extensive surgeries that are necessary to deal with the heart condition that's, that's already at play. Yet there's a lot of recent work that's found a significant overlap in the genetic associations of congenital heart disease and neurodevelopmental de delay enough that people are starting to tease and do, well, maybe it's not all hypoxia. Even if we have the perfect surgeries, maybe there's another mechanism at play here. So this is the outline of sort of what's included in this piece of work. We start with a set of patients. So we have two parents um, and, there's a Denuvo, and they've identified a de novo variant in the fetus associated with a congenital heart disease um, condition that was identified um, in utero at Yale. We created, or specifically, uh, Matt created a version of this identified gene of interest, SMC5 knockout, and the tadpole. And then we have another collaborator at Johns Hopkins who developed a specific central nervous system only knockout of the SMC5 variant, and that we examined with the MRI. So this is sort of the trans species, um, really interesting, motivated by a single patient taken to two different animal models to investigate both the um, heart as well as brain components of what might be going on um, with this mutation. So exactly what happened. So we had fetal cardiogram at 23 weeks gestation. So this is uh, one view of the valves that you're seeing here. And then if I sort of overlay this laser Doppler, what you can see if you're an expert in the field um, is that there's some lack of flow in the direction that would be expected. And it's recapitulated in the second field of view here where you should be seeing an even balance of blue and red, but you definitely see a dominance of blue. 
And just going back and forth between these, you can definitely see that there is a lack of flow in one direction being the red direction versus the blue direction. Um, and if you're also an expert, you can look at the anatomical view here that should be showing all four chambers, but you see both the um, right ventricle and left ventricle are showing different aspects that are, that are not what you wanna see um, in these images. So we also have follow-up data on this patient where they're now about nine months of age and they are showing gross motor delay, which they think are results of neurodevelopmental changes, not necessarily congenital heart defect problems, um, but the patient has also undergone a number of cardiac procedures. So that gives you a clinical view of sort of this personalized medicine approach to what's happening um, on the clinical side. So now we go to the tadpole. So we do CRISPR-Cas9 mediated gene editing of the SMC5 um, gene knockout that was identified in this patient. There was three candidate genes that came up. Two were not interesting because of the effect where what roles they play. SMC5 was interesting because of its role in neurodevelop or progenitor cell development. Does the tadpole have uh, differences in their heart development? So this is an um, optical coherence tomography image of the developing tadpole heart. And they're measuring here just the diastolic systolic diameter differences. Um, and there's an effect size for sure. So in the control subjects, you see normal ventricular diameter changes. And in the knockouts, you see decreases in both dimensions. Huh? Does the tadpole have four changes? I know it doesn't. I don't know how many it does have. <laughs> Sorry. Nothing. That looks like two. I, <laughs> I think two would be my guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I've never imaged anything but the brain. So this stuff I find fascinating, but good question. I can follow up with, with Matt on, on that if you're specifically interested in the anatomy of the tadpole. Um, all right. So heart changes with the SMC5 variant. Check. Are there neural changes? The answer is also yes. So they looked at gross using OCT again, brain development size, and they see microcephaly um, in the tadpole brains, which was small effect size, but very reproducible, about a 7% decrease in brain size. Um, they're limited in OCT to be able to do just length measurements rather than volume. Yeah. Yep. They are able to image the whole tadpole. It's immobilized in sort of an agar solution. Um, and being able to normalize by, by the tadpole size and the developmental stage, they're very, very specific down to the hour of when they measure them. So the next thing was, what about neural effects? So we've got in the tadpole, we've got, specific, we've got manifestations both in the heart of something happening with this SMC5 knockout, as well as in the brain. And for this, um, this was Dr. Jordan, um, Philip Jordan, who is at John Hawkins, who created this mouse version of the SMC5 knockout that's specific to the central nervous system. Um, and then those mice came to Yale and I had the pleasure of doing the imaging of these animals. And again, an anesthetized imaging preparation. Um, and the first thing that we were able to see is, yes, both normalized to body size, um, as well as without normalization, there is microcephaly associated with this SMC5 knockout. And the most exciting thing I thought about this was we were able to sort of tease apart the differences between them being cardiac effects and then there being also neural effects that are independent of the cardiac effects. And to that, we also had um, validation that the heart showed no or abnormalities in the mice. That's the dogma clinically. Yes. So, but now we're looking at the gene also expressed in neurons. Yeah. So, my question is can you knock out this gene only in cells which later on the time? You then get the neuronal defect. So, that would be the important question. Yes. I, I believe that Jordan's working on that now. But absolutely. Um, and one, one other check that we did do on this is that interestingly enough, it was not a change in ventricular volume. So that was something that was consistent across these animals as well. So it's definitely the neural tissue. Um, and we did a little bit of analyses to sort of, what is it a certain structure? I mean, we, 
I would like to take these data to Jason, for example, to say like, can you do a more sophisticated um, regional analysis of the brain? But what we were able to do in house was sort of see that it's, it's a uniform decrease, it seems, except for um, the medulla, which is a subset of structures sort of deep in the brain, which actually show an increase in size. So that's, that's the very basic structural um, characterization that we were able to do on these mice. We also did some fMRI data. So this is uh, just resting state, bold fMRI data. And we were playing with the analysis a little bit here to sort of say, like, we've got some individual differences. This is also a mixed sex sample and it is underpowered. So this is very exploratory of sort of like, can we see something here that sort of motivates us to go forward with a more sophisticated um, approach? So using connectivity analyses, similar to the last uh, study that I was talking about, we sort of measured inter-mouse differences. So how does this connect on different from that mouse's connectome? Um, and if we do all the pairs, do we sort of get a sense of sort of what's differentiating of just mice in our sample? Split them across, we do the same thing in the two different groups. So in our control mice and our uh, conditional knockout mice, what sort of distinguishes one mouse from another in that data set? And is it different from what distinguishes a mouse taken from one group and a mouse taken from the other group? And we were able to sort of pull out some features um, from the fMRI data that say, yes, there are connectivity differences um, that show one mouse is that mouse and not another mouse in this group or that group. And they are indeed different from the connectivity differences that distinguish a mouse in the control group from a mouse in the conditional knockout group. Now this is a different kind of um, approach to these data than I, I think other people have taken. Um, and I'm a little bit out of my depth on how to do it computationally rigorously. So this is definitely an exploratory approach and I wanna emphasize that. Um, so this is my cartoon that's maybe a little late in the talk about just sort of region to region bold connectivity. And we're using um, here ROI to ROI comparisons where you have say synchronous activity versus asynchronous activity um, to just show this is, this is what we were using as the fingerprint, so to speak, to look at both individual differences as well as um, cross group differences here. So that's to evaluate this, we then um, thresholded those maps um, to be able to say these are sort of the, the distinguishing features between the two groups. And what sort of popped at the other end was implications in both olfactory regions, the hippocampus, medulla and cerebellum. So we went back to um, the folks who are looking at the SMC5 variants and are these regions at all any interest. Um, and they got very excited. I don't know if they would have been excited about any region, but I have followed up with Jordan a little bit after this. Um, and he's been doing some specific olfactory tasks, which she, seem to be so, showing deficits in these conditional knockout animals. So that sort of gives you the whole sort of full circle approach um, going from this specific patient who had this de novo variant um, coupled with both neurological as well as congenital heart defect um, phenotypes, which we were able to recapitulate in the tadpole, and then look at the specific CNS um, manifestation in the mouse. So I thought it was a very cool project. There's a lot of work still to be done um, on it, but I think that's, that's the end of this chapter. And we are at 11.50. Um, it's your choice if you want to pepper me with questions or you want me to speed talk through one last, one last episode. <clears throat> C5 project, we only did fMRI. We didn't do the simultaneous um, calcium imaging. I think we do have the structural, we do have a structural MRI image um, for, we use it for all our registrations. It's, it's for every mouse. We do, we do the same structural image in every mouse. The structural differences were global in, in the SMC5 animal. So yeah, there would be a reduction in the, in the olfactory bulb that we saw. The effect size is small, but it's present. When you do growth comparison, do you see if there's a sensation on Yeah, 
basic basic measures, yes. And since it's a an aesthetized data set, it's a little easier to wrangle. Um, but overall, I don't think we've been as rigorous as you would have been. Um, which, I mean, if you want to take a look at the data, I'd be curious what you found as well. So these data we're happy to share um, and to follow up. And as I, it's it, it's an exploratory study. Um, so any hypotheses that it would generate would be very interesting sort of for, for these folks, which avenue they want to take it down. Yeah. As you know, like, uh, it's a bit difficult. To, uh, like, of course, it's early stage. Uh, it's going to it becomes a bit difficult to reach a conclusion. I fully agree. Oh, um, I, I would hesitate to think it, about it in that way necessarily. There's different mechanisms that are, that are at play when you go from awake to anesthetized. I mean, you're, you're changing the entire context of the experiment um, and you're introducing what the copious effects that isoflurane has on physiology and everything else. And of course there's deepen with deeper um, anesthesia I, this is a question for physiology that's beyond my expertise, but my expectation is that it would be a different set of effects, not necessarily a continuum, because you do have the step function of ISO, no ISO. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, our anesthesia protocol is a little bit strange, and this is in part um, bridging the two worlds between optical imagers who are scandalized by the idea that you would use ISO in the first place, let alone something else in addition to it, um, and those who are on the MRI side who are sort of fixated on finding, fixated is the wrong connotation, but motivated to find the right cocktail that they can use. So the 0.5 ISO is the compromise that we came to in that particular setting. I wouldn't argue that it's the thing to do. We've since started to move towards awake as well. Um, but the 0.5 ISO was something that we could do very quickly. Um, we could do in the optical setup to sort of see that we're getting the same optical patterns that we're getting in the scatter, scanner as well um, and do some, some of those checks and balances. It was also as light as we could push it um, with our particular setup. Now the animals that are under 0.5 ISO, you can't set up an animal and get them in the scanner on 0.5, that won't work. You have to get them in the scanner and then you sort of taper off the ISO as quickly as you can and you reach this sort of quiescent stable state. Um, and that's, that's when, since we have live time viewing of our calcium imaging data, we use that as a real tr sort of feedback that's more informative even than our physiological measurements of heart rate, breath rate, and everything else. As we can see the features in the calcium imaging signal once you've watched hundreds of hours of it and say like, okay, they're sort of at this, I see this sort of pocketed activity. I don't see the frequency of waves quite so much in the calcium imaging data. We've hit that sort of sweet spot for the activity that we're used to seeing in the calcium imaging signal where we're at this 0.5 ISO target. Now, we wouldn't have that with the metatomidine introduced because there isn't sort of that previous experience from the optical imaging side that we can rely on. So there's a lot of reality choices went into why we're at 0.5 ISO rather than physiologically motivated. It's a bit of a ramble, sorry. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering, like, because at the beginning you showed the, like, the calcium imaging which you said was, uh, what happens on a good day, do you have an example of one? Oh, uh, bad days. Um, not in a slide right now, but we've, there's some very interesting stuff that happens in calcium imaging data. Um, so you can, if you have a very deeply anesthetized animal, you will get a lot of these law cortical waves that sort of just go from the back of the brain to the front of the brain repeatedly. And then there's sort of a lack of activity in between it. Um, you can have a really bad day when your mouse dies and then all the calcium floor for it comes out of the cells. You get this bloom of gigantic signal 
Um, that's the end. Um, and you can have some animals that have really strong flashes of activity. We have some projects that we've done in some models of autism um, and they have very flashy activity. Their dynamics seem to be much quicker um, and sparser than typical activity. Um, these are like screensavers, you can watch them all day. Um, and there's all kinds of features um, in that signal that are really interesting to try and match to bold signals. Yeah, um, so for multiple reasons. Um, we've played with a number of different calcium indicators. We've played with fast, slow, we've played with excitatory neural markers, we've played in, with inhibitory interneurons, glia. Basically anybody who has a glowing mouse, I go to them and say, can I please put you in my scanner? Um, and there's different expression levels based on the cell type population. I mean, you've got like 80% of neurons are excitatory, 20% you've got some of these inhibitory interneurons. So that's going to play into the signal difference. What kind of fluorophore you're using? We've got the, I, the technical term is, is not in my brain right now, but the Tiger 1 versus the Tiger 2 mice. Those look very, very different. You have different SNR. You also have different dynamics um, from those. So it's, it's an entire world opens up when you start introducing fluorophores, um, for better or for worse. Um, but I can talk all day about it. And it, about, but the, the short answer is yes. You have differences in SNR, you have differences in dynamics, you have differences in activity features. Tiger two. <laughs> so, so, so Yep, definitely. This is another motivating reason why we want to go for the transverse sinus injections. Because um, you skip the whole development in utero of having G-CAMP during your brain development, which my personal bias is to think that that seems to be having an effect, just mostly motivated by the dramatic difference you see between Tiger 1 and Tiger 2. Tiger 2 have absolutely gorgeous calcium signal, but it's weird looking when you compare it to the Tiger 1, and it shouldn't be. So one reason why we like the transverse sinus injections, you skip that, you sort of get, these animals are much more robust. You get way less strange phenotypes in the, in the transverse sinuses than you do the genetically encoded ones. Um, so I'm sort, of, I'm sort of starting to tread on some of my colleagues' toes and sort of saying some of these things of, but why are the fluorescence ones strange? But some of them are strange. I totally agree with you on that. Um, but at the same time, the fluorescence imaging is such a powerful tool. Um, you gain a lot for, and, the, and there's a lot left to be worked out. I mean, there are four or four is coming out almost every day. They label something new, something different in a different way. So it, it's good to be very cognizant that there's caveats to introducing a four into the brain. Big surprise. Um, just keep them in mind when you use it for very fun stuff. Okay. What physiology are you <clears throat> Yep, uh, it depends on the experiment. Um, if we're doing anesthetized imaging, we try and do the mouse ox so that we have um, heart rate, breath rate, O2 sat. Um, we always do temperature. Um, so those are in the anesthetized setting, we get all that stuff. Um, we're not doing intubation, for example, with the low isoflurane, it's, it's not really feasible to have that set up. So they're free breathing, but they're breathing at a rate that we would be the one that we would program. Um, so we don't have the slow breathing that typically comes from isoflurane. Um, a, a number of our experiments, none of the ones that I went over today are now moving towards awake where we've just got breath rate um, on those animals. So is there a particular measure you had in mind or? Well, are you collecting breath rate or are you using So for breath rate, we use a compression pad. So it is based on chest cavity movement. So that's uh, in the anesthetized animals with the mouse ox system. So however they, they get breath rate and heart rate out of that optical probe. Sorry? Uh, we are collecting the signal from, I, I don't understand exactly sort of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this 
the mouse X setup that we have, it does output sort of a, a, a trace that we've been trusting as a, a measurement, but you're saying that there's, there's more to that. Some of those are derived, like the, the OTSAT is inferred, I believe. Um, and we haven't gone deeper into that signal yet. So I'd be curious to see what, what you're teasing out of those two. Okay. We've used them as exclusion criteria more than anything else. Um, we've not added those measures into any sort of pre-processing at this point. We basically like, does this meet our checklist of stable animal? Yes or no? That's the way we've used it. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I, the acknowledgement slide. Um, basically, yeah. thanks everybody who's been involved with this work and you guys for, for hosting me um, and reintroducing me back to in-person life. Um, so thank you very much.